Next, I bring to the stage someone who is already changing the conversation at UVA and in Charlottesville through events like these. Please welcome UVA's ninth president, Jim Ryan. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jim Ryan, and I am thrilled to be here and honored to introduce our main speaker, James Foreman, Jr. James Foreman, Jr. is a professor at Yale Law School. He attended public schools in Detroit and New York City before graduating from the Atlanta Public Schools. After attending Brown University and Yale Law School, he worked as a law clerk for Judge William Norris of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals and later for Justice Sandra Day O'Connor of the United States Supreme Court. After clerking, James could have taken any job he wanted. He chose to join the Public Defender Service in Washington, D.C., where for six years he represented both juveniles and adults charged with crimes. During his time as a public defender, Professor Foreman became frustrated with the lack of education and job opportunities for his clients, so he did something about it. In 1997, along with David Domenici, he started the Maya Angelou Public Charter School, an alternative school for those who had dropped out and for youth who had previously been arrested. A decade later, in 2007, Maya Angelou School expanded and agreed to run the school inside DC's juvenile prison. That school, which had long been a failure, has been transformed under the leadership of the Maya Angelou staff. Indeed, a court monitor overseeing DC's juvenile justice system called the turnaround extraordinary. At Yale, Professor Foreman teaches constitutional law, a seminar entitled Race, Class, and Punishment, and a seminar called Inside Out, Issues in Criminal Justice in which Yale law students study alongside men incarcerated in a Connecticut prison. Professor Foreman writes in the areas of criminal procedure and criminal law policy, constitutional law, juvenile justice, and education law and policy. His particular interests are in schools, prisons, and police, and the class and race dimensions of those institutions. As if this weren't enough, Professor Foreman's first book, first book, entitled Locking Up Our Own, Crime and Punishment in Black America, received rave reviews, was on many top 10 lists, including the New York Times 10 Best Books of 2017, and was awarded the 2018 Pulitzer Prize for general nonfiction. As if that weren't enough, he's also appeared on The Daily Show. <laughs> if I could end with just a personal note, I have known James for 25 years, and I consider it a privilege to call him a friend. We met while clerking, I served for several years on the board of the Maya Angelou Charter School, and I can tell you from personal experience that he is as decent and kind as he is brilliant, and he is as wise as he is smart. I'm thrilled that he took time out of his busy schedule to be with us today, and I hope you'll join me in giving Professor Foreman a very warm welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming out in this rain. It's a difficult day, I think, for a lot of us watching the events on television. Um, I have not been the, the victim of, of sexual violence myself, but I've spent a lot of time with people who have been, uh, and I know how hard that is. Um, and to see the reasons that people don't come forward being replayed again and again uh, is, has been very hard for me today, and I know it's been very hard for, for many people. Um, so I just wanna, I wanna acknowledge that and I wanna appreciate, appreciate you, you coming. Oh. I want to thank Professor Carson. It, there was, when I was awarded the Pulitzer, as much well, more well known than my being awarding of it was that it was the year that Kendrick Lamar won the first Pulitzer Prize for 
uh, for music. Um, and so I don't, you know, I don't want to jinx anybody, but I'm feeling like over the course of his career, there may be a Pulitzer waiting for, for Professor Carson, so I want to acknowledge his contributions. I want to thank President Ryan for bringing me down here. I've known your new president since we were in our 20s, as he said. Um, I've aged, he hasn't. <laughs> He's in a position of great authority now, but I can tell you that I've seen him do some of the least glamorous work around. We were on the board together of the Maya Angelou School, trying to educate a second chance school, trying to educate kids who had been in the juvenile justice system in Washington, DC. And I watched Jim Ryan, when he was on the faculty here at the law school, give up the thing that's most precious, his time to drive up from Charlottesville time and time again to help us figure out how we were going to develop a strong curriculum, how we were going to hire excellent teachers, how we were going to develop an ethic and a culture of caring and inclusion on our campus. Um, so for those of you that have not gotten to know him yet, um, I can tell you this about Jim Ryan. He will give you all that he has. He will give this community all that he has. He cares to his toes about the University of Virginia, its students, and the broader Charlottesville community. And he is deeply committed to questions of racial and economic justice. Oh. I also want to thank uh, uh, Dean uh, Risa Galyuboff and Professor Ann Coughlin. When I was trying to think about my remarks, of, uh, they gave me their time uh, and their wisdom in, in helping me understand and learn a little bit about uh, what's been going on in this, in this community. And I also want to thank the, and acknowledge the authors of this book, Charlottesville 2017, The Legacy of Race and Inequity. Are any of the, any of the contributors to that book in the audience by any chance? Yes, please raise your hands. I read this volume cover to cover uh, last week. Uh, it was a powerful resource for, to help me understand some of the issues that this community has been grappling with over the past year and for many years um, before that. So I stand before you today with great humility. It's the humility that comes from being an outsider. An ally, yes, but still an outsider. I know that I've arrived in the middle of an ongoing community-wide conversation, one that began my, before my arrival and will continue for months and years after my departure. I know that many in this community still suffer from physical trauma, others from emotional trauma, and some still from moral trauma, to borrow a term used by Professor Willis Jenkins in his essay for this volume. Recovering from that trauma, building a sense of community, an authentic community that acknowledges its historic injustices as it commits to repairing them, this will be the work of many, many years. And what I'm gonna to try to do today from my outsider vantage point is to offer some sense of historical context and perspective. I've been thinking about some of the issues that we confront today in this country and in this community for quite some time. When I was a child growing up in Atlanta, one of the things I found most outrageous, and let me, and it's a high bar because there was plenty to be outraged by in Georgia in the 1980s, um, but one of the things that I found most outrageous was our state flag, which back then looked like this. Now I would sit in my homeroom in my almost all black high school watching our African American groundskeeper hoist this flag every day. And I was appalled that we were honoring a symbol of slave owners and slavery in this way. And I would think as I looked at the flag, I would think about my parents. My parents met in the civil rights movement. They met in SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. 
It was one of the four major civil rights organizations of the 1960s. SNCC was considered the most aggressive, the most radical, the most community-oriented. They were the shock troops of the movement. And they fought, my parents fought against everything that this, this flag symbolized. My dad, pictured here, being arrested uh, by Atlanta police when he was protesting segregation, he was the executive secretary of SNCC. It's what, what we might call the chief operating officer today. Here he is marching in Montgomery He's in the overalls, which was the unofficial SNCC uniform of the time. My mom was not as well known, but she was just as committed. She dropped out of college to join SNCC, where she met my father. They were an interracial couple at a time when those marriages were illegal in many states in this country. And their generation, their generation's activism, their generation's courage in the face of violence, they changed and transformed America in ways that we have yet to, in, in some regards, we haven't fully acknowledged. I mean, theirs was the generation that marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, that faced down Bull Connor's dogs, that went to D.C. 250,000 strong for the March on Washington for jobs and freedom. And I say, by the way, when I say their generation, some of you may, were a part of that generation. I'm not going to call anybody out. But if you were, when I say there, you know I'm talking about you. I mean your. I mean, their generation led the fight that brought us the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the Fair Housing Act of 1968. I mean, Congress passed those laws, presidents signed them, but know why they came about. They came about because of organizers on the ground. The Supreme Court decision that outlawed bans on interracial marriages, Loving versus Virginia, it was decided in the year that I was born. And that decision called prohibitions on interracial marriages, and I'm quoting here, measures designed to maintain white supremacy. So now, it's 20 years after Loving, and I'm supposed to honor the Confederate flag another symbol of white supremacy, before going on with my schoolwork every day. So when I got to law school, I wrote a law review article. Not going to change the world. Activism changes the world, not law review articles. But I wrote a law review article, a student note it was called, about the Georgia state flag. And we had always been told that the Georgia flag included the Confederate flag because after the Civil War, descendants of soldiers who had died fighting the Confederacy wanted to honor them. Now, I didn't see that as a defense, mind you, but I took it as a fact. And then I began my research and historical dig digging, and I discovered that the Georgia flag hadn't been changed to include the Confederate flag until 1956. Oh. I don't need to ask a Southern audience what was important about 1956. Brown versus the Board of Education is decided in 1954. And in the years following, many in the South engaged in acts of massive resistance to the integration mandate. Some of those were symbolic, and the flag change was one of them. So the state flag had nothing to do with fallen ancestors and everything to do with resisting integration and maintaining the Jim Crow racial hierarchy. Now, at the time, there were no published reports documenting when the flag was changed or why. And so I found, I found this historical discovery exciting. And I should be clear, it didn't excite me because it helped me explain 1956. It excited me because it helped me to understand and explain right now the moment I was in, the place and the issues that I was confronting. And I think I've been historically minded ever since I learned the truth about the flag. And I'm going to bring some of that orientation to our conversation today. Because I want to talk about racist ideas over time and across American history. I want to talk about what we remember and what we forget and why. I want to talk about how white supremacy has twisted and distorted our understanding of what is real and what is false. 
And having this conversation, I think, will help us to answer and see the connections between what might otherwise seem to be unrelated questions. Questions like this. How come so many states have sex offender registries brimming with the names of people charged with convicted of crimes from when they were teenagers? How come Donald Trump decades ago took out a full page ad in the paper calling for the death penalty of black teenagers charged with rape in Central Park, teens who have since been proven innocent and have yet to receive their apology from Mr. Trump? How come we rush to judgment when the defendants are black or poor? But when a white Supreme Court nominee faces allegations of violent attempted rape when he was a teenager, the supposed law and order crowd begins for the very first time to talk about presumption of innocence and due process of law and how we can't ruin a person's life based on what they did when they were young. The history I want to talk about today will help us answer questions like, given that most racial groups use drugs at roughly similar rates, why, when people were asked in a survey to close your eyes for a second and envision a drug user and describe that person to me, why did 95% of respondents envision and describe a black face? Questions like, why did so many people struggle to understand the motivations of Dylan Roof, the white man who killed nine African-American churchgoers in Charleston in 2015? Roof, remember, was unequivocal in stating his motivations. He wrote that he wanted to start a race war and he wanted to defend white supremacy. And yet, so many elected officials sounded like South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley, who said, we'll never understand what motivates anyone to enter one of our places of worship and take the life of another. Well, we'll never understand if we don't listen. <laughs> and yes, questions like this one. Why 13 months ago were avowed white supremacists who promised violence and arrived armed to the teeth, allowed to march on this community, allowed to rampage and allowed to attack students and other peaceable anti-racist activists? Now, the questions that I have asked, I believe, are intimately connected. And to see how, we need to take a closer look at the history of myths about race and crime in America. So my claim today is this. Maintaining legally enshrined white supremacy, chattel slavery followed by Jim Crow, required maintaining a set of myths about black people and a related set of myths about white people. And those myths survive today, even after the formal demise of the institutions that gave rise to them. And one of those myths, indeed the central one, concerns race, crime, and violence. Now, before I say more about that, let me point out a couple things quickly. First, when I talk about chattel slavery and Jim Crow, I'm not talking about the way they're typically taught in school, historical blips or road bumps, one-seventh, one-eighth, one-ninth of the curriculum, something maybe you get to in February. No, I'm talking about the overwhelming majority of American history. So in this country, we have had almost 350 years of slavery or segregation and fewer than 70 years without them. The second point that I want to make is that a lot of people, most if not all, who participated in and lived through from positions of power, these systems of oppression, most of them thought about themselves as good, decent, law-abiding people. This is human nature. We all want to think of ourselves as good. So here's the thing. If you want to think of yourself as a good and just person, and you want to think of your social order as good and just, then you have to do some serious mental work to, rationalizing, to rationalize holding another group of people in bondage 
and stealing their wealth and criminalizing their attempts to read or to vote. You have to explain to the world, yes, but most importantly, you have to explain to yourself why it's okay to buy, sell, and breed other people for profit, to steal, to steal their children at auction block, to beat them bloody. And these explanations, these rationalizations, those become the myths and the lies that a racist society depends on. And the myths don't die easily. The laws may change, but the lies linger in our consciousness, in our societal DNA, and in all of us, in people of all colors, orientations, and political persuasions. Defenders of slavery needed a host of arguments to defend such a barbaric institution. Here's a few. Blacks are lazy and indolent, they said. That's why they must be beaten. Blacks have a higher pain threshold than whites, they said. So that's why beatings that might seem harsh or depraved really weren't. Blacks don't care about their children, they said. So it wasn't cruel to rip children from their mothers and fathers and sell them to the highest, builder, the highest bidder. Blacks were indifferent to or incapable of learning. So there was no reason to allow them to read or, read or write. But the most powerful lie deployed to defend slavery concerned race and crime. Since blacks were inherently savage creatures, proponents of slavery claimed, slavery was necessary to restrain their criminal impulses. Now, one of the leading proponents of this lie was a faculty member right here at UVA, I'm sorry to report. As professor, although that I could be giving this talk anywhere and because it was so widely held, there'd be a faculty, faculty member almost anywhere who would have bought into this lie. Professor Lisa Wolfork describes in her contribution to the Charlottesville volume that I mentioned earlier, she talked about Dr. Paul Barringer, a graduate of this medical school who would go on to become chairman of the faculty, which I understand um, was something like the equivalent of president today. And in, 19, in, in the 1900s, he gave a speech entitled The American Negro, Past and Future. And in the address, Dr. Berenger attacked abolition and he defended slavery on the grounds that blacks were inherently savage. Negroes suffered from what he called 50 centuries of savagery in the blood. And slavery, in Berenger's view, was a positive good. It forced black people to exhibit good behavior. So in his view, abolition wasn't a mistake because two centuries of force, well, sorry, abolition was a mistake because two centuries of forced good behavior wasn't enough time to control this criminal impulse. Now, these abhorrent views were not limited to the South. In 1860, the New York Herald published a piece about runaway slaves in Canada. It arrived recently in Canada, and the article purported to document how the slaves, once they had arrived in Canada, had run amok. They were causing criminal mischief and mayhem. The report claimed that the criminal calendars would be bare of a prosecution but for the Negro prisoners. And free of slavery, the Herald argued, blacks would return to their natural state, deviants who acted with a savage ferocity peculiar to the vicious Negro. Race, said the hair, uh, rape was a special problem. When the lust comes over them, they are worse than the wild beasts of the forest. Now, these claims about black criminality did more than simply justify slavery. They also laid the foundation for a legal system that would target blacks. For example, here in Virginia, before the Civil War, there were 73 crimes on the books that led to the death penalty for slaves. For whites, there was only one. Now, so far I've focused on one aspect of the myth of the black criminal, but there's another side to this coin. Because claims about black criminality weren't only used to justify brutality toward black people. They were also used to deflect and, de and deter a much needed conversation about violence against black people, specifically racially motivated violence by whites against blacks. 
Khalil Gibran Muhammad's absolute masterful book, The Condemnation of Blackness. If you have not read it, please, you look, we are, I'm 20 minutes in and you have two reading assignments. Charlottesville 2017 y'all, and, and Condemnation of Blackness. But this book provides many examples of this phenomenon and here's one. So in the late 1890s, early 20th century, blacks in Atlanta, as in much of the South, were brutalized by a slate of, 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 of lynchings. And in 1906 in particular, there was a spasm of racial violence. It was officially called the race riots of 1906, but like a lot of the race riots of that era, the term race riot hid the fact that almost all of the victims were black and almost all of the perpetrators were white. And despite the fact that more than 25 blacks were killed and hundreds more were injured, not a single white person was arrested. And when the violence finally subsided, black leaders in that city asked for an inquiry into the causes of the violence. And here's what they were told by one prominent civic leader. Responsibility, the leader said, didn't lie with the white police or the state militia members who had aided and abetted the violence. No, the civic leader blamed black criminality. She said, I don't know what we can say about this terrible affair, but there's one thing I can say, and that is to urge all of you to drive the criminals from out amongst you. So this dynamic, the refusal to name black and white racial terror for what it was, indeed the refusal to name it at all, that would continue into the 20th century. And the KKK played this game rather brilliantly. I mean, think about it. Here you have an organization whose principal activities included illegal, unjustified, and barbaric attacks on black citizens, right? The KKK ignored the official legal system that at least in name criminalized its conduct. And yet, what was the group's motto? Law and order. Here they proclaim it. They proclaim themselves lovers of law and order in their constitution. Here in this photo from a Muncie, Indiana march, you can see the Klan marching under the sign, we stand for law and order. I mean, it's ridiculous on its face in a way. I mean, the hoods are a good sign that they were doing something illegal and disorderly. But the fact that they could claim the mantle of law and order tells us something important. Such a claim only made sense in a world that didn't understand the Klan's white on black violence as a threat or even as a crime. But while the, the Klan's move in this regard was audacious, almost to the point of head spinning, it wasn't alone. When I was researching my book, I was interested in learning about how black crime was discussed in the national press for over the past century. And because I'm hopelessly old fashioned about things, I use the reader's guide to periodical literature in bound copies. Does anybody, does anybody remember this? All right. I don't know. I, I might have to, I gotta get the clan off the screen. I can't, I can't, I can't deal with this for too much longer. I'm, oh, all right, good, all right, good. All right, there's no more slides. <laughs> You're good. So the reader's guide, the reader's guide for people that don't remember, it was, a, it was a subject matter file of thousands of the leading newspapers and periodicals. And so you could look up a topic like the University of Virginia and you could see any articles published that year that mentioned the University of Virginia. It was basically Google, but not as good. And I had, I had dozens of those dusty volumes on my shelf. And one day I decided to take an, a break from the entries on black crime, of which there were many, and instead to look for entries on white crime. And the first year I looked, 1950, I think it was, I, I found no entries. And the next year was the same. So, they jumped, so then I jumped ahead to 1955, 1956. Y'all know why I went to 1955. That was the year of one of the most notorious acts of racial terror in American history, the murder of Emmett Till. So I looked, nothing. Now Emmett Till's murder was covered, of course, but it wasn't labeled white crime. 
Because this is the thing, for most of this country's history, and arguably even to this day, we didn't and don't have a vocabulary to even call white crime by its name. It doesn't even sound right sometimes when people say it. And we don't and didn't understand white on black racial violence as a distinct category, as a recurring practice, as something that's foundational to American history. Which is why when Dylan Roof says his motivation is to start a race war and says his motivation is to kill black people in defense of white supremacy, pundits and commentators can ask, I wonder what motivated him to do it. <laughs> and it's why when hundreds of angry men promised violence and arrived with ammunition, guns, tiki torches, and some of the most vile anti-Semitic and racist chants imaginable, it wasn't comprehended appropriately by relevant officials as a clear and present threat. Now, if I had more time, I would talk about the other ways in which the myths and the lies from the slavery era persist to this day and how that persistence continues to influence law, policy, and social institutions. But we're going to have to wait on that or maybe we'll, it'll come up in question and answer. What I want to spend the last few minutes talking about is I want to say a few words about on the theme of resistance, on the idea of claiming our power. Because despite the history that I share with you today, I'm a profoundly hopeful person. I'm not naive. I don't think I am. Although I guess Naive people don't actually know we're naive if we're naive. <laughs> but I don't think I'm naive, but I am hopeful. And I want to talk about how we can make this hope a real hope rather than a, a naive hope. And I've already alluded to the first part of my answer because it's built into the structure of my remarks today. We need to acknowledge, we need to confront, and we need to commit ourselves to redress Redress is key here. The history I just described a tiny, tiny portion of. And when I watched President Ryan's speech on the anniversary of, of August 11th, I saw him call for a spirit of candid self-examination. And I was reminded, as I listened to those remarks, how our relationship with our history is a collective choice. Other countries have made different choices in the wake of systematic racist violence. After the Holocaust, Germany made financial reparations to the victims, began a decade-long project of building monuments and museums to commemorate the horrors of Nazism and the bravery of those who resisted it. That's an example of candid self-examination. South Africa, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, sought to develop a shared national narrative of human rights, as abu of human rights abuses under apartheid by telling the stories of both victims and perpetrators. Now, neither of those countries' responses are perfect. They're not perfect in theory, and they're not, definitely not perfect in execution. But they're trying in a way that, as a nation, we haven't. They're making the effort to face up to the full horror of racist terror, not to justify it. They're naming racially motivated violence as such. They're not hiding it. They're marking down in disgrace the names of the perpetrators, not celebrating them. And the memor they're memorializing and compensating the victims, not erasing their suffering. And we, tragically, in this country, are a century behind in our obligation to undertake the same reckoning. But there's no better place to begin than, than here, and there's no better time to begin than now. Now, sitting alongside this spirit of candid self-examination, if we're going to move from self-criticism to action, we're going to need allies. And I would encourage all of us in the racial justice struggle to adopt a stance of what I think, what I think of as maximum allyship. Now, here, I'm not talking about what it means to be an ally specifically. That's an important conversation in its own right. But I'm talking about what it means to seek allies. Now, it, it isn't always easy to remain open 
to allies when you are struggling against injustice. In times of stress, it is so easy for movements and people to become divided. It's natural, it's tempting to push away friends, to say, you have to agree, or former friends, you have to agree 100% on all positions before I will call you an ally. And it, I know how tempting it is to maintain this stance of purity because I've fallen prey to it myself. But when I feel myself going in that direction, I often try to remind myself of a moment in one of my very favorite sermons by Dr. Martin Luther King. This speech is called The Drum Major Instinct. Who knows the drum major instinct by any chance? Okay. Oh, see, all right. You know what? Y'all are going to do this before you do, no offense to the authors, but you're going to listen to King first. It's shorter than the two books. <laughs> really, listen to the drum major instinct. Um, you, can, you can hear it, watch it, and read it online very easily now. He delivered this, this speech in, at his home church, Ebenezer Baptist in February of 1968. And in it, he talks about being in jail in Birmingham and getting into a conversation with his white jailers. And his jailers were preaching to him about the virtues of segregation, and they were preaching against intermarriage. Dr. King was arguing the opposite. And then Dr. King says, and here I'm quoting him, he says, and then we got down one day to the point, it was the second or third day, to talk about where these jailers lived and how much they were earning. And when those brothers told me what they were earning, I said, now you know what? You ought to be marching with us. You're just as poor as Negroes. And I said, you are put in the position of supporting your oppressor because through prejudice and blindness, you fail to see that the same forces that oppress Negroes in American society oppress poor white people. And, and all of you are living, all you are living on is the satisfaction of your skin being white and the drum major instinct of thinking that you are somebody big because you are white. And you're so poor, you can't even send your children to school. You ought to be out here marching with us every time we have a march. Now, what I love so much about this talk is not just Dr. King's understanding of class. I love that. And... Props to those who wanted to clap that. I love that, right? Central to his thinking in the later years of his life. But also his openness to building alliances, even with people that he had little reason initially to think might ever be his allies, right? I mean, if he can see his jailers as potential allies, I tell myself when I'm tempted to not adopt this stance of maximum allyship, then who can't be an ally? And that mindset is something that I strive for in my work. So I strive to be an advocate who is big hearted, who is open minded, who looks for common ground, who tries to move beyond distrust, who tries to talk and listen across difference. And even though, it, I do, even though I know the distrust is deep and it has deep and understandable roots, because I believe that Fundamentally, seeking to build relationships of trust, of consistency, of accountability, that's what it's going to take to make meaningful social change possible. So I'm going to sit down now, but, or in a couple minutes, there's a clock behind me telling me exactly how much time I have. Don't look at it, though, because then you... <laughs> I want to offer one final thought on this idea of, how, of claiming our power right, of staying in this fight even when it looks like the odds are long as it looks right now given the state of this country. And this message, this message in particular is for the advocates and the activists out there, the people who call meetings and feel like I called a meeting and the same six people showed up as showed up last time who feel like, why aren't other people listening to me? Why don't other people understand the urgency of this moment and the urgency of this fight? And it's based on a conversation that I had with my father before he passed. And we had watched a film about the civil rights movement. 
and when it was over, you know, I said, what did you think of it? You know, you were there. He said he liked it. He said, I liked it. He said, I really like that they show this history on film because more people watch movies than read books. Just something that I probably should have thought about. <laughs> but he said, but here's what I didn't like about it. He said, I didn't like a, the fact that they, they made it seem like everybody was in the movement. He said, it wasn't like that. He said, we were lonely. We were few. I would go on college campuses, he said, to try to recruit students. All these colleges now have pictures of their students that went to the civil rights movement. I would go on college campuses. They would run SNCC off the campus because they didn't want us recruiting students because they might drop out of college. See my mom. He said, here's the thing, though. When you are fighting an injustice that appears so insurmountable, so locked in as racism, Jim Crow, the things we're talking about here today, ongoing white supremacy. He said, people will tell you that change is impossible. And he said, but here's the thing. If you ignore them, as we did, and you defeat and overturn that injustice and transform the country, the same people who told you that change was impossible will turn around and say, oh, that was inevitable. I knew that was going to happen. And then they'll make a movie about it. <laughs> I mean, there were 250,000 people at the March on Washington, and 10 years later, 10 million people said they were there. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know what the idea is in this room. I don't know the group of people who are going to come together with a strategy. I know that SNCC was started on a college campus, so it's good. It's a good start already. We're here in Charlottesville. I don't know who or what idea is in this room that is going to be bigger and bolder than anything that I will be able to come up with either now in this talk or in the question and answer, that is going to help us defeat the racist violence and the racist ideology that underlies that violence and the anti-Semitic violence and the anti-Semitic ideology that underlies that violence. But I know that the idea and the people are here in this room. And I know that when you fight that fight and you transform America in a way that previous generations have done, and they make a movie about you, I'll be sitting there in the front row, popcorn in hand, elbowing Jim Ryan, and clapping. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is this on? All right. Um, James, thanks very much. Uh, so I have a million questions I want to ask you. But I'll um, just ask 999,000. Um, so I want to start by asking you um, where you think we are in this moment in terms of progress, regress. So you know, a lot of people, I think, doubt whether we've actually made that much progress since the 1960s, right? And you, know, you told a great story about your parents and the work that they did that led to real change in terms of the Voting Rights Act, Civil Rights Act. 
but then also talked about you know, the inequities that we continue to face, the myths that continue, the lack of understanding, the lack of appreciation of both the historical um, uh, trend of white on black violence and the current lack of comprehension about it. So I'm just curious in your own view, like where are we in this struggle? All right, that's a big question. Yeah. Well, let me start with this. There's no point in time, if you want to go back to that graph that I put up there before, there's no point in time that's earlier on that graph that you would say to me, as a black person, would you rather be born then? Like, there's no moment where I say, oh, yeah, that's, I want that. Right. Right? No right. moment. Right. And so, to me, then, by definition, that means that we have made real progress in terms of where we are now versus where we were. Now, you can't, to be clear, right, where we were was the most vile place you can possibly imagine. So you can make progress from a state of, of, of deep inequity and inequality and still be in a bad position, right? And so I don't want to... Right. Having said that, I do think that... I mean, and this has been said before, but I think it's true. I think that the fundamental challenge that we have, and now I'm, I'm specifically focusing right now on racial justice because the answer to this question, it turns so much, right? You need to be particular and concrete. That's why when I answered it right. initially, I said, you know, as a black person, because you need to be very specific about what kind of oppression you're talking about, and the answer might change depending on. But in the context of race, I think what people have identified is accurate, which is that we live in a moment where there are opportunities for some African Americans that are unparalleled in American history. And alongside that, we live in a moment of incredible division, incredible racial inequity. And, uh, and, and for some people, like for the kids that we work with at Maya Angelou, there's a way in which people feel trapped. So like my, where I grew up in Atlanta, Two blocks from my house, as a child, were two enormous institutions. There was the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary and a General Motors plant. That's when I was a kid. I just went back to take my son to see where I grew up. And this has been true for a while, but I saw it anew on this visit. One of those buildings has built an addition, two additions actually, since I was a kid. And the other building has closed and has shut its doors. And, you know, y'all don't have to have gone to Atlanta to know that the penitentiary is still there. And what is so, I think, then deeply prob problematic and then related to the class conversation that we were just having is that I remember as a kid so many working and entry-level black middle-class families who worked in that plant right. and who <clears throat> got jobs, who, who got, I mean, I talked to guys. I remember talking to a guy and he talked about, he, he, he was talking about young people today, you know, he was doing the young people today thing, but, <laughs> but in a different way, in a different way, because he was saying young people today don't have the same give, they don't have the same forgiveness as we had, he was. He said, I was a knucklehead when I was 18, 19, you know, didn't study that much in school and didn't focus. And I knocked around for a couple years. And then when I was 21 or 20 or 21, I got a job at the very end of the line, the last position, cleaning up the muck and the paint. Mm -hmm. And But I worked my way up the line. And he was now talking to me as somebody who took his family 
to Florida on vacation. And so to me, that's the thing that I'm seeing in the, in the racial justice front and figuring out and really identifying both that class dimension, that poverty dimension, and specifically what are we gonna try to lift up those, the parts of the community that have suffered most. And so therefore, what does that mean? It means we can't be satisfied by having a sprinkling of representation in positions of power. Like we can't say, I mean, I'm all for, I'm all in for diversifying faculty administration, like 2,000% in, it's much of what I work on. Right. But, but it, it can't be only that because we have to also be making a commitment to the parts of the community that aren't in the next five years gonna be on the faculty of University of Virginia no matter what we do and ask ourselves, well, what are we doing for, what's our obligation to and for right. them? Right, yeah. So, con so continue on the same theme a little bit but bringing it closer to home. Um, how do you fit um, what happened here on August 11th and 12th in 2017 into that um, picture? So, you know, there, there are some who think, and, and the alt-right in particular, you know, so there are some who think that this is just a trend that's continuing. You look at that timeline and you pay attention to history and it's not that surprising. Others think, no, the fact that this is happening now and so, with such intensity is like a last gasp. Right, the country's changing and um, and changing for the better, and this is sort of the last gasp of um, those with retrograde and hateful views. What do you think? I do think I think it's true that um, you know uh, Michelle Alexander had a piece in the New York Times last weekend where she said. You know, we're not the resistance, they're the resistance. And yeah. the point that she was making, which I find appealing, I think the point that she was making, or the point that I would make connected to the point that she made was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna connect something to this so we can all, all three of us. <laughs> <laughs> was the idea that th those trends that you've just described, both in terms of, you know, and you can see lots of evidence if you look at attitudes you know, based on age breakdown, right? Um, yeah. You know, if we would let right. 15 year olds vote, you know, then we would have a completely different, you know, p Congress and presidency and state houses than we have now. So, <laughs> and so I do think that, the, that we are long term in the ascendancy. Um, having said that, um, because it, for lots of reasons, including I, th th that these ideas that are being, I mean, they're not even ideas that are being, uh, you know, this racism uh, is, uh, I think it's deeply embedded, but I think it's ultimately going to lose. And I think that all of the people who talk about this moment as being a backlash to President Obama and all of that, mm -hmm. I think there's a, so much truth to that. Um, so... I guess I align myself in response to your question as thinking that last gasp, I guess, is too strong for me because I think it has like a few more breaths than that. Right. Um, and but but I do think it's I do think it's dying. I think they're I think they're afraid. I think they're scared. I think they feel, you know. Hey, dislocated, replaced, lost, all of the things that people have talked about, I think is right. Um, and so I guess in that sense, that's another, I guess I would align myself with a sort of right. optimistic position. Right. So you talk a little bit about, um, and I say a fair bit about um, the importance of acknowledging our history as, a, as um, removing an obstacle to moving forward in a sense, uh, and something I uh, completely agree with. Why do you think we have such a difficult time with that, right? I mean, what's, what is to be afraid of in acknowledging history? That's, this is a two-part question. And then um, if we were to do it, what would it look like? Let me answer the, let me answer the second part first, okay. and then as I'm answering it, maybe I'll think of an answer to the first part. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
it, so just let's just talk about public monuments and memorials. I mean, when I, when I graduated from law school and was driving out to California uh, to work for a judge in Los Angeles, I drove from Atlanta to LA. And I didn't drive on any of the highways. Um, and one of the reasons I did it was, um, y'all remember Take Back the Night? Yep. Okay. So my, I first learned about Take Back, the, for me, my first exposure to Take Back Tonight was in college when I kind of walked around a corner and I was in the, you, it was in the fraternity quad. You had to walk through the fraternity quad to get to the dining hall, which was its own problem. But there we were, and there were a group of women standing up, and they were telling stories. And, and I listened. And it was, it was, other than talking to family members, it was my first time being exposed to a public uh, accounting in that way of what it meant to be a victim of violence, of sexual violence, what it meant to be afraid, and then specifically people's public commitment to take back the night, not to be afraid further, and, and the institutional and structural things that would need to be put in place to allow that to happen. So mine was take back, so this was my take back the South Drive. Because my, parent, my dad in particular was very traumatized by a lot of the violence that he experienced, and it was it, it, to his death, uh, he suffered from that trauma. And when I did, I wanted to go see monuments and memorials to the civil rights movement, to, to the freedom fighters, to my parents' generation, to the victims of violence. And I went, and this was before Google Maps and everything else, um, I, went, I went to try to find Money, Mississippi, where Emmett Till was killed. And then I went to Medgar Evers' house in Jackson, Mississippi. And in neither of those places was there a, a, there wasn't a piece of dirt acknowledging these locations. There was nothing in Money, Mississippi, not a plaque on the side of the road, mm. which there is now, but it keeps getting racially vandalized. There was nothing to even say this happened to you. Right. So to me, the starting point is is, ha is having these kinds of monuments and memorials everywhere. I mean, you shouldn't be able to drive eight miles in the south or in the north, for that matter, without coming across these monuments to both racism and the resistance to it. So that's one thing. Right. And that, to me, I'll say, and I told you I wrote my initial thing on the taking down of the flag. Yep. I care about the t removal. I, it's a, to me, it's, it's fundamentally important. But I care even more about the addition, what right. I'm talking about right now. Um, so I care about them both. But the, sometimes the addition, I feel like, it gets lost in the conversation because it's right. harder to build something than it is to take something down. And so our attention is drawn, as mine was, to the thing that we have now. Uh, so, and I guess I feel like that has to also then become part of the history that we teach in schools, um, which it isn't now. Right. I mean, you know, it's still the case that we have this tiny little sliver of, when I was saying about one eighth and one ninth of our, what I mean is that, my, is that if you look at the units, the curricular units in elementary school, you would not, that map that I showed you, that showed you how long, no, no kid that I ever talked to says, oh yeah, we had slavery in this country for longer than we haven't. Nobody knows that. Right. Right. So, so those are the sorts of things. Right. Um, so you talk about allies um, and what and and being open-minded and looking for um, looking for allies where you might not expect to find them and and the uh, speech of dr. King what would you say to those um, who might respond by saying what you're talking about is compromising and part of being an activist is not compromising 
I would say that I totally get that, and there are times where I feel that. So I would just start by acknowledging how real that position is. I would also say that I'm making a distinction between my goal, my end goal on which I'm not going to compromise, and the process of getting to that goal. So like the things that I just identified to you are not are not, when I say we should have these monuments and these memorials everywhere, every, that's what I'm talking about is, as on that metric, that's my goal. Right. That's where I'm going. Right. I'm not going to stop. I'm not talking about entering, entering into an agreement with you where I agree that some one broke down memorial on the corner is going to be satisfactory. That's not what right. I mean. I mean having an open conversation with you to try to figure out where are you coming from? What are your needs? What brings you to this place? What do you care about? What can we agree on? We're gonna, we're gonna disagree on a lot, but we can agree on some things and working together on those things without, while being absolutely clear that I'm not, that, I'm not done then. Right. I'm gonna keep fighting and I'm gonna keep going and you may decide, well that's, you're, you're stopping because that was your piece and that's what you could work on and, and that's fine. I mean, you see it in the movement against mass incarceration, right? right? Which is the, the, right. The, the particular thing that I spend most of my time working on. And there's people who come to that movement because they want to save money, right? Cost control. Right. They say, yeah, well, right, 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 I'm a, right. this is a right-wing libertarian. I'm a conservative. Yeah. I want to I save money. Well, my ultimate goal is to have more money invested in the communities. So we may not, we're not gonna agree on the overall size of the budget that we wanna have five years or 10 years down, and we're not gonna agree on what our, our tax level should be to get there. Right. But we can agree about closing this prison. Right. So, um, thank you. Um, in just a minute, uh, we're gonna open it up to questions from the audience, but to allow you to, um, think of some questions. I want to actually turn back to the article that James was talking about. Um, you may not know this. I, didn't, I had no idea you were going to talk about this article about the flag. Um, he wrote it in 1991. Just so you know, I've been um, following him as an author since then. Um, this is as a law student. And I, the opening of this article, um, I want to read to you because I just, I just think it's incredibly powerful. Um, and then, like I said, we'll um, open it up to questions. It's the spring of 1984 in Atlanta, and the groundskeeper at Franklin Delano Roosevelt High School is starting his morning routine. In my 12th grade homeroom, home we have finished the morning business. Attendance has been taken. The announcements have been made. We're simply waiting for the bell to signal the start of the first class period. As I wait, my eyes return to the groundskeeper, who is carefully unfurling and raising a series of flags. First is the American flag, last is the Atlanta Public Schools flag, and sandwiched between the two is the Georgia State flag. I am drawn to this flag, particularly to its wholesale incorporation of Dixie. I observe the same scene almost every morning, and almost every morning I hate the fact that I watch. I want so desperately to ignore the flag, ignore Dix Dixie, and ignore the history for which it stands. For relief, I take my eyes off the flag and glance down again at the groundskeeper, who is still pulling the cords to raise the trio of flags. Like most of the students and teachers, the groundskeeper is black. I think of the incongruity of having black children in a largely black city watch a black man raise the symbol of the Confederacy for us all to honor. I tell myself to laugh, hoping that this will keep me from crying, but I cannot laugh and I dare not cry, so I close my eyes and try to forget, if I could just forget. My eyes close tightly, my fists clench, and I slowly force from my mind images of the flag, of the Ku Klux Klan, of Bull Connor and George Wallace, of black people in chains, hanging from trees, kept illiterate, denied the opportunity to vote. The bell is rung, my teacher is calling my name. James, are you okay? I look up startled. Yes, ma'am, I'm fine, I say, as I collect my books and head for class. I'm fine, I repeat to myself as I walk out the door. I have forgotten, I have purged my mind, I am able to get up and walk out of the door. But overcoming the flag is taking a piece of me. 
a peace that I will not easily recover. Okay, so we have some time for questions. I think that there is a microphone available. Uh, if you just raise your hand, I'll let James call on whoever we would like to hear from. It's a little bit hard to see, so yeah, bear with us. It's a little hard for us to see, but I'm doing my best. Yes. I think up in the... I think up uh, about two-thirds of the way. Yep. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you very much for your simulating remarks. Um, I'm taking with your comments about the absence of monuments, especially to the most egregious uh, events of our past uh, as a nation. Um, I'm taking also with your comments about what we can do to close prisons. Um, most of these concern the visible outward mm -hmm. symbolic signs of things that, of which we are all ashamed. But I want to ask you to think about the things we do not see. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like for you to think about, uh, in this university community, for example, what pressures can be placed on universities, uh, many of which are invested in private prisons, uh, invested in the prison industrial complex, um, what can we do that is just but, but one example of the invisible things um, most students who matriculate to any university don't have much sense of its investments. We know about the public cases. We know about Columbia's decision to disinvest. But what part of this movement, this prison abolition movement, uh, should attend to those hidden um, ways that these egregious aspects of our nation are reproduced uh, out of sight. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think, I think a big part, and I, so my major political activism in college was around divestment, different divestment, so this was divestment of uh, stocks in businesses that did business in South Africa. And I spent more time doing that than I spent probably in class um, when I was in college, but I think that it was, it was, I think it was the right, it was the right choice. It was the right choice for me and I don't regret it. Um, I think that those kind of hidden, uh, what you're calling, I think correctly, uh, there are so many ways, I mean, so to me the, the thing about, one of the things about mass incarceration is that it has tentacles that touch almost every aspect of our society. So we tend to think about, you know, the, the first thing is we think about, well, the prosecutors, right, or um, the prisons themselves. But then you look a bit, little bit deeper and you start to understand things like the contracts that private company, I mean, I can talk uh, to, you know, people, my, my, my wife is, is, is half Nigerian and we talk to her family in Nigeria for free on WhatsApp. And it's five, six, seven dollars a minute to have a conversation with somebody in a prison. Well, and why is that? It's not because of the technology doesn't exist. It's because of contracts that exist that enrich companies which then lobby legislators to keep and, and regulators to keep and maintain those contracts. So, you know, and that's just one tiny example, but there are so many things about how the, uh, the census is drawn, right? So that prisoners are counted as residents, not of the communities that they come from, but of the prisons where they're held when what that does is it diminishes the political power of precisely those communities that might want to lobby against over punishment and over incarceration and it enriches politically the communities that have the most to benefit from from keeping those so and these are things you can't these are things you can't see and these are things that most people don't know so it seems to me that candid self-examination right 
demands and calls for an investigation of all of those little nooks and crannies. And sometimes people say to me, well, you know, what's the most important or what's the most powerful or what's the most impactful thing that we could do to try to confront mass incarceration? And, you know, I might have my, my priorities here or there, but really what I believe is that because it touches so many people and places and institutions, we have to do everything, and we have to do everything all at once. Now, not none of us individually can do everything. We can only take a piece individually, right? I can only work on my piece. But the question is, is each of us finding our piece? Like, whatever that is for you. It might be if you're an educator, and I just, I have to say this um, since I'm in a university community, but it might be through your role as an educator. I teach a class. It was mentioned, uh, uh, President Ryan mentioned in my introduction, I teach a class where every week I go into a Connecticut State prison and study race in the criminal justice system. The same class that I used to teach at Yale, I now teach in a Connecticut prison, and the class is made up of 10 men who are incarcerated, and in the spring I teach it to, in a women's prison, so then it's 10 women, and 10 students from Yale. We study the same material, but in a completely different setting, and it's transformational both for the students uh, from my home university and the students who are incarcerated. And I know that work, I've read that work like that goes on here, but, but so my point that I'm making is pick your piece, pick your fight, right? And know that as you're fighting your fight, somebody else is fighting the fight next to you, some of your allies fighting the fight next to you, and fight uh, with, uh, with, a relentless, with a fervor and a commitment to seeing it through to the end. And if we all do that, if we all do one piece, then we will, we will dismantle mass incarceration and replace it with a justice system that actually deserves the word justice in it. so much, uh, Professor Foreman. My name is Michelle Goodwin, and I have a question and a comment. And the question is, picking up on, I think, the brilliance of your speech with regard to mythology, what have we sacrificed in our failure to name white crime, particularly in instances where communities of color have fallen victim? And it's interesting to note, when you look back at the historical record, what's named in newspapers, it's usually called race riots, which would imply that it's blacks and whites both rioting, and it's a failure to name white aggression in the suppression of black communities. And then my comment is to your naming Dr. King and the importance of allyship. In 1966, two years before he passed away, he was asked, well, why is it that you're talking about more than Birmingham? You're talking about so many things, women, Vietnam, poverty. And he said, I refuse to segregate my moral concerns. And I think that that's a lesson for us all. Thank you. I almost want to leave it right there and just say, <laughs> come, give, come give the next speech with me. We'll do it together. I, I think, just to, to respond briefly to your question, I, I think we, we have, what we've sacrificed is, is our ability to name it, so therefore it doesn't have a, it's not a category, so then we don't even, so we don't have a way of ever connecting, a, they, they become single episodes, single incidents, and we don't have a way of connecting them tie, and tying them to a larger narrative. And so then we don't understand actually the role that they're playing in both our history and in our present because we haven't connected. To me, that's the, the main thing that we lose. Okay, yeah, go here and then there, yeah. Okay, Th thank you. Oh no, I'll, we'll, we'll get to you next. I just didn't, I didn't see your hand. The, the lights are really hard for, for seeing hands. 
So, so we're up? Okay. Okay, sorry. Thank you. So many thoughts. I'll share it with you gentlemen via email and to save the crowd time. But uh, I've decided to uh, call myself a brown person because everyone is. I'm not white. I can see the skin of you guys and to see the skin against your shirts. There's no white. There's no black. Everybody, whether they're indigenous peoples, Asian, we're just on the spectrum of brown. We're all brown people. And so in, in that light, I think about what uh, Director Spike Lee said. He says, we're not going to be able to deal with so-called race issues in America until we deal with the genocide of the indigenous peoples. And I did not hear you talk about that. That's not a complaint. But that's just if America is going to really confront America, we started as the Virginia Company. And we're going to have to deal with how we treated indigenous uh, uh, peoples as a precursor to how we treated enslaved African Americans. It's, it's all in the same soup. It's, it's got to have to all be dealt with. And so, for example, there's recently you, you spoke of monuments, and then I'll stop here with just what this point. You spoke of monuments. There have been monuments put up, chimneys, rock chimneys, along Shenandoah National Park of the folks grandmothers dragged from their cabins when the federal government established Shenandoah National Park. So there are monuments being put up to uh, uh, sort of uh, remember the people who were taken off their land. But there are no monuments that I'm aware of of the people taken off their land by the people who were taken off their land. So I think we got to go to the beginning with this thing and Eleanor, uh, excuse me, uh, Delegate Eleanor Holmes Norton out of D.C. I think said it best. We are a nation of birth defects. And that doesn't mean we can't move on from them, but we can't change them. They, they're there, but we can move forward. But I want to move forward responsibly, not in any way that puts anything under the carpet. But I speak to you as a fellow brown man. Thank you. Thank you. you. I think we have time for one more question. Yeah, and I'll be around. There's a, I think there's, I've been told there'll be, there's a book signing out there. I don't know if that's actually happening, but I'm going to go out there. Hopefully there's some books. I'm happy to sign them. Oh, one thing to say about the books is that, quick note, especially for any of the students, but at, no, this is for anybody, students or not. When I was in school, I was on heavy, heavy financial aid. Financial aid is great, but... It never really covered any of the extras. And I remember going to uh, a, 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 an event and I wanted to buy a book. I didn't have money for the book. And I can't say I thought of it then, but when my book came out, I thought, when I go to speak in communities and speak in libraries and speak at college campuses and elsewhere, I'm gonna tell people that the books, nobody who wants a book should walk out without a book because of money. So it's on a pay what you can basis, pay what you can, and the rest will be taken care of. And I'll be out there. Um, so I am from Virginia, and I am a student of the public school system. I, so yeah, my, you, you saw I had that in my bio, right? Because the bios are so annoying. It's all like who you clerked for this fancy person or that fancy person. I'm like, I went to, I'm a graduate from the Atlanta Public Schools. Give them some love. Right, right. Well, the reason why I say that is because, um, you know, I've been, I'm an independent student a lot. So, you know, I've studied this whole conversation about who I am, where I come from, the systems in place, you know, the, the criminal system, the educational system. And then I'm always trying to galvanize people to try to do something about the problems that we're facing. But what I've learned is that the school system is where we learn about who we're supposed to be and what we're supposed to do when we get into society. But there is a problem because history is the big problem in my mind as far as the school system goes because mm -hmm. it is in history that some learn that they were of great descent, that they come from a legacy mm -hmm. of great things, and others learn that their history comes from inferiority, that they were not quite human, and so forth and so on. 
And that legacy continues today. Our kids are still growing up in a system that says some come from a great legacy, others come from an inferiority legacy. So when we have the conversation, I guess my question is, everything that you talked about tonight spoke on systems, a systematic problem, a systemic problems that we're facing. We have new generations of people coming up. We have the same racial problems. People are still fighting about the same issues. How then do we start to teach the young people that, or how do we affect change in the curriculums mm -hmm. that began to teach young people a balanced, you know, th there are great orators, there are great contributors of all colors. How do we get that into the curriculum that it's not just, and as much as I love Dr. King and Rosa Parks, yes. there are so many other black Americans who contributed to the greatness of this country. So that's Well, that's question. a great question. And I, I'm so glad you made the point because one of the things that I take from your point too, which is, you know, I want to talk, I want to teach more about the history that I just talked about, but I definitely don't want that to be, and I think this is a really good corrective. I'm not trying to have that be, you know, the only history, the only African American history that students get, right, is a history of, of slavery and every time Black History Month in my son's school when they get ready to do a play, I'm always like looking at the play and I'm like, is this gonna be, like is, is the play gonna just be about black people being slaves or like is there gonna be more to that story? And so I really agree with you that there has to be this richer and fuller perspective. Um, and I don't know what to do to make that happen other than for us to collectively talk about it and demand it in public settings the way that you are now, and also to lift up and just acknowledge and honor uh, the teachers in the room. If, are there any K-12 teachers in the room? I know I see a couple up here. On, I know I see a couple. So, the, the, so the, there, I, I know these teachers, they're, they're from Richmond. And they're doing amazing, amazing work. So I really hope that you, you're with, yeah, you go talk, you know, connect with them. But you're right. Thank you. Well, James, thanks very much. <laughs>